All right, well, today we are continuing in the uh, Gospel of Matthew. If you want to follow along, we'll be in Matthew 10. And as you know, or maybe you don't know, if you've been with us for a while, though, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. We're back into it after the, the holiday break. And we're in chapter 10 where Jesus has given a speech to his disciples as they are ready to go and do what, what he has done, which is to go and to share the Gospel, uh, heal the sick, cast out demons, and in chapter 10, he gives this long discourse about uh, what they can expect as they go out uh, and do what he has done. And there's an immediate context to what he says, which is, you know, right to, to what they're going to be experiencing. But there's also a sort of transcendent meaning. And we're also looking into that and we're calling this speech kind of the journey of faith. Because as you look at it and break it down, it very much describes how a Christian uh, goes through their spiritual journey, their spiritual growth and their spiritual walk. And so that's, we're kind of doing both as we go through this passage. We're looking at the immediate context, and then we're looking at the more transcendent context as well. Now, I've been part of the church for a long time. Uh, I've been in leadership in the church for almost 30 years, and before that, I went to church uh, kind of with Johanna was just sharing. My parents took me to church, uh, at times forced me to go to church, which was actually a good thing for those of you parents out there who are wondering. It was good for me to have to go to church uh, and I've seen a lot of things in the church, and most of it, most of it, really wonderful things, wonderful people. I've seen people be generous beyond, really beyond their means. I've seen people uh, change and grow. But like anything, there's also some toxic things I've seen over the over the years. And one of the things which I've seen happen quite often is the abuse of this phrase, "God told me." Because there's nothing really wrong with the idea of God telling people things, and there's nothing wrong sharing if you feel like God has, has told you something. But I've often seen it used as a source of manipulation. I've seen it used by leadership as a way of trying to build themselves up as something, someone particularly holy. I've seen it used in marriages. I've seen it used in politics. I've seen it used between Christians as they argue over music and diet and all kinds of things. And, and it's one of these phrases that is kind of hard to argue against because when someone throws out, well, God told me, where do you go from there? And especially if you don't know the Scripture very well, when someone throws out, God told me, or God has, God has you know, laid this on my heart, there's all kinds of different ways people say it. If you don't know the Scripture very well and what they're saying is counter to the Scripture, then this is where you get a lot of toxicity within churches. And again, I want to make it clear that I do believe that God speaks to His people. I believe He speaks to his, the Holy Spirit, His Word, His people, and circumstances. But all these things have to go together, and they can't be contradictory to one another. Uh, that's why it's somewhat dangerous to say the prayer, well, Lord, just open the door and I'll go through it. And if it's closed, then I guess that's not your will. Because there's more to God's will than just opportunity or lack of opportunity. And we have to remember that there's also spirits that go against the will of God. So, so you have to be willing to, to go a little bit deeper than just, well, is it easy for me to do this or not? But in my opinion, the goal of faith, and I think this is important to understand, the goal of faith is not to have God speak to us like as if we're some kind of alien or, or he's some kind of alien outside force speaking to someone that's radically different from him. But rather, the desire of, the, of our faith is to have our minds in sync with the mind of Christ. And I do believe that sometimes God speaks in sort of an outside supernatural way. But if you look at the Bible, most often that takes place because people are unable to hear him in any other way. When Gideon gets spoken to in the book of Judges uh, by God, he sees this vision of God and he's, this angel. It's because Gideon is like he's the last guy in the entire country that he believes God would ever speak to. He's the, he's the least, he calls himself, I'm the least member of my family in the smallest, least clan uh, tr or tribe in Israel. And so God has to break in supernaturally because Gideon's just not there at all. Isaiah gets spoken to supernaturally in uh, chapter 6 in particular. But if you read it carefully, it's, it's during a time he's in mourning of the death of the king. He can't, he can't see the way forward. And he really is kind of at the bottom of having no hope. And so God breaks into that and speaks to him supernaturally. But, but really the goal of faith, though, is to have the mind of Christ, that we are transformed into the image of Christ. And that goes into what we're talking about today a little bit in the scripture out of the Gospel of Matthew. 
As I said, this is part of a speech that Jesus is giving to his disciples. And we're going to first look at it from just the immediate context. And Jesus says this, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like the teacher and the servant to be like the master. See, that's important. That's kind of talking about that synchronicity, being like him. If the head of the household is called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden which will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered to your ear, in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. As we go through this passage, we have to remember that this is, this is a passage which is immediately following the scriptures, the passages that we re- went through last week, where Jesus talks about the challenges that they're going to face, that they're going to be brought before governors, they're going to be brought before kings, that household people will, you know, family will turn against family over the idea of exactly what Jesus Christ is about. Friend will turn against friend over the idea of who Jesus is. And then he follows them up, follows that, those passages up with this one. So it's important to understand that basically his message to the disciples is this. If they are against me, then they are going to also be against you. And you just need to know that. If they are, Jesus is telling his disciples, if they are against me, if they are against what I am preaching, if they are against what I am doing, then they are going to also be against you as well. And so then he encourages his disciples that they need to be bold and they need to share what they've been taught by Jesus. And most of what they've been taught by Jesus is is in private conversation. That's why he says, what's been whispered in your ear, uh, speak out loud. You know, what was said to you at night, proclaim out loud. Because most of what they've, they've they've been taught by Jesus is private. Except for the Sermon on the Mount and maybe a few other exceptions where he's doing a public teaching, the vast majority of what we read in the Gospels is private teaching between back, back and forth between Jesus and the disciples. For example, in the Gospel of John, the most well-known verse in the Bible, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life, comes in the context of a meeting at night that Jesus has with this guy named Nicodemus. And so so what he's saying here isn't, he's not trying to be like, I'm going to tell you something like like in secret because it's wrong, and then I want you to say it out loud. He's just doing the facts. You know, most of the time when he taught the disciples, it was was privately. Uh, The Gospel of John, again, it's after the Last Supper that you have this long teaching that Jesus gives about, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches. That whole thing is a private teaching. It's a private conversation that later the author, the, the Apostle John, wrote. So that's what he's talking about there. But then, of course, Jesus being Jesus, he throws in some things which, which can be difficult to understand. And particularly the second half of verse 25 might throw some people when he says, if the head of the household is be called Beelzebub, how much more so the members of his own household? What's Jesus talking about here? Well, if you remember in the past, you know, we've talked about in the sermon we had called... Uh, introducing the Pharisees to, to folks. Oftentimes when the Pharisees, who were, who were religious, the religious people of kind of Jesus' time, and also people that we could actually identify with maybe more closely than we were, were comfortable identifying with, when they would get frustrated with Jesus, they would often just start calling him names. It's just, it, it, we even see it today. Yeah, in, in politics today, when people get frustrated, you expect them to act like adults, but they just start calling people names. And one of the things that they would often accuse, the Pharisees would accuse Jesus of when they were angry with him and they didn't know what to do with him. And especially when he began to cast out demons, they would say he is casting out the demons because his authority comes from a greater demon. And you see this happen a couple times in the Gospel of Matthew. One of them is Matthew 9, uh, 33 through 34. It says, when the demon was driven out, The man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed, and they said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. In other words, it's by the power and the authority of this greater demon that these littler demons have to listen to Jesus. And Jesus finds this irritating. Uh, And and it's understandable, you know, that the very word of God made flesh, as we we read in, uh, as we sang in, in one of the songs, 
you know, humbles himself, from, comes from his glory to take upon human flesh, to suffer for our sake, gets compared to demons. And, and he's told time and time again, well, it's because it's his authority is coming from demons. More specifically, we see it later on in, in Matthew 12, and we'll look at this later on uh, a couple weeks. But it says this, it's another time when Jesus is teaching. It says, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And this time Jesus fires back. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city and household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? In other words, Jesus is saying, this is just a stupid thing you're saying. If I'm going to be, if, if, if I'm casting out demons by the authority of Satan, then Satan is fighting Satan. That makes no sense. If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, then he tells the Pharisees, if I drive demons out by Beelzebub, then by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they'll be your judges. And so Beelzebub, if just for you to know, the, it, it, the word is beat, beat, Baal. If you ever read the Old Testament, there's this, there's this constant uh, person that keeps brought, brought up as a, a subject of worship named Baal, or the, or the priest of Baal. Baal just means Lord in a language other than Hebrew. It's called Uder, Uderic. And so it's like in Hebrew, the, the generic term for Lord is El, El, El Shaddai, Elohim. Baal is also kind of a generic term, except it's always, it's in the Old Testament, because they're the priests that are against the people of Israel, it's always evil. And Baal Zebub means the Lord of the air, Lord of flies, that sort of thing. As I said, Jesus, I think, found it very galling to be, you know, compared to, to Satan. Because he knows, he knows everything about these demons. He knows these folks. He knows, you know, the Pharisees and what they're about. And so when he talks to his disciples about this, he's almost using kind of a, a sarcastic humor when he tells them, uh, verse 25, it is enough for the student to be like his teacher, the servant like his master. And then he says, if the head of the household is called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So what he's telling his disciples is, you should not expect to be treated any differently than I've been treated. And if they're calling me, if they're saying I'm doing this by the power of Beelzebub, then they're going to say the same thing about you. Because, hey, if the head of the household, if the head of our merry band is compared to Beelzebub, then you're going to be get compared to Beelzebub too. But then he gives them this assurance. He says, so do not be afraid of them. Because it's nonsense. And Jesus is saying, this is nonsense. They're going to say it's coming from the devil. The fact you're even casting out demons, they're going to say it's coming from the devil. Because it threatens the power. It threatens the religious structure. He says, but don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them because there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. In fact, the he's saying the truth is going to come out. There's nothing hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. In other words, he's saying don't let these nonsensical accusations cause you to have fear. Don't let these accusations stop you. The truth of their hearts and the truths of my words will be made clear. It will be, they'll work themselves out. As time goes on, people will see the truth of who they are, and they'll see the truth of who I am. So what I've taught you in the private conversations, share with the world around you. Teach others. Shout out loud those words of truth, which were slipped to you like a note of hope is slipped under the door of a prison that says, help is coming, freedom is close. And that's the immediate context of this verse. That's the immediate to the disciples what they're hearing. Don't be afraid. Don't let these accusations make you wonder, you know, where, where is our authority coming from? Don't, don't worry about, you have to argue to the point of winning every argument. The truth is going to show itself out. Just do what I did. Just say what I've told you. Teach what I've taught you. But there's also this transcendent meaning of the verses as well. And that's what, I really, that's what I'm going to focus on for the second, kind of the second half of the sermon. How does this What's the transcendent meaning that also applies to us? And when verse 24 and 25 is really where we're going to focus. Where it says, The student is not above his teacher, nor is the servant above his master. It's enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like its master. 
So the idea here isn't about being above or smarter than the master, but it's being like the master. And I think Jesus is trying to get this point across, because the way that they used to do teaching back then is that is what Jesus does with the disciples was pretty common. Even among the Greeks, you would find a teacher, and then they would just kind of follow that teacher around and, and live with live with him, spend time with him, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, and just grow to know the teacher and become like the teacher. That's The word disciple means to become disciplined, to be disciplined, to be like the master. And Jesus was by far not the only person that did this thing where he had a group of people following him around and teaching them. This is something that the Greeks did, like I say. is something the rabbis did. But usually the goal was to become greater than the teacher, to, to gain in such knowledge that you become greater. For example, you have, a, you know, you have Plato, and then I, I think his disciple that actually writes the, 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 the book that Plato's The Republic, which is like what Plato is all known about, was actually Socrates, who was one of his disciples. I might be wrong in, in the actual names, but the, the one that wrote Plato's Republic wasn't Plato. It was his disciple. And his disciple is, is, you know, the idea is to take the, the ideas of the master and make them even greater. And Jesus is saying, that's not what this is about. You don't need to become greater than me because you're not going to be. <laughs> As if Jesus has to say that. But, uh, you know, people don't quite understand who Jesus is. You're not going to become greater than him. But you want to become like him. And that is really Jesus' goal. Become like me. You're not going to become greater than Jesus. You're not going to become wiser than Jesus. Now Jesus does say... In, the, in one of the, the Gospels, they will do greater things. They will preach to more people, the kind of sort of thing. But the, the greatness of the character of the person, you're never going to become greater, but you can become like. And that's what he wants to, wants to have us do. And again, it comes back to this idea that our goal in our faith isn't to just always experience the supernatural because the supernatural, when God breaks into human history and kind of breaks into human lives, is because... They're not looking at all toward God. If you, if you look in the gospel, when God breaks in, they're not looking for this to happen. When Mary is approached and told that she's going to have the Christ child, she's not expecting this. Yeah, and so there's this supernatural break, and it did, Mary didn't come to it by her own conclusion, and she never would have. If that thought had come into her own mind, I think Mary would have said, I'm just thinking crazy thoughts, and this isn't going to happen. And same with Joseph. Joseph wasn't thinking that, yes, indeed, my fiance is going to become supernaturally impregnated by the Holy Spirit. He had to have someone break in because that's not the sort of thing that people normally think is going to happen. But the goal of our life isn't to always have this supernatural breaking in, but the goal of our faith is to grow into the place where our minds are in sync with the mind of Christ. And the Apostle Paul is a good example of this. The Apostle Paul had both things happen to him, right? The Apostle Paul, when he was a young man, He's, he's called Saul at the time. He hates the church. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, you know, as Stephen is being stoned to death, we read that as one of the, the uh, readings we did a, a few weeks ago, and it ends with, and Saul was there giving approval into what was done. That Saul becomes the Apostle Paul. And he hates the church, and he's trying to destroy it. And as you know, probably most of you know, on the way to Damascus, he has a supernatural experience. Jesus Christ makes himself appear to, you know, to Paul because nothing else was going to break through his angry, arrogant, and stubborn mind, and brilliant mind, actually. And so he breaks in. He has this, this experience on the road to Damascus. He falls off his donkey. He's blinded for a while. And then he starts going through the process of growing in faith, growing and becoming like Christ. And he talks about this a lot because he was transformed from this angry man that hated the church to one who was one of the great, you know, carriers of the gospel throughout the world. We owe a lot to the Apostle Paul. And so this is, these are just some things said in three of his different letters. These are by no means the only time he talks about this topic, but here's some three ones that, three that are pretty well known. One of out of Ephesians, he says, Surely you have heard of him and were taught in him, being Christ, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of what? Your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice the emphasis there is what is transformed is the mind. 
He's not saying transform your emotions. He's not saying transform your bodies. Transform your minds. 1 Corinthians, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. He's talking about the Holy Spirit there. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things which come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So he's saying that they understand the spiritual things because they have the Holy Spirit of God within them that has transformed their minds so they can understand the things of God. Romans 12, we read this this morning, 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. So sometimes people have asked me in my own spiritual walk, uh, why aren't you more, uh, I don't know how you would say it, uh, more charismatic in the way that you approach things? Where is the speaking in tongues in your life? Where is the, the, you know, the that kind of supernatural aspect? And I don't deny that these things are real. But I would come back and say that those things are not the goal of faith. To have these charismatic or supernatural experiences are not the goal of our faith. They're kind of like the garnish on the side of the meal, but they're not to be the centerpiece of the meal. Sometimes these things happen, and it's great when they do. They're a little bit uplifting. Sometimes Sometimes they can be very uplifting, or they can give a person a focus. But at the end of the day, it comes back to what's between your ears. Is this thing being transformed into the image of Christ? Are you thinking Christ's thoughts? Are you seeing the world as Christ sees him. That's what it's about, the transformation of the mind, the renewing of the mind. This is what it means to become like the master. We're not to become like the master in that, you know, his physical appearance. We don't know what Jesus' physical appearance was like. We're not to be like the master in, in, in how he used to, you know, how he would sound or, or the way he would say a word because we don't know what that is. We're to become like the master in how he thinks and, and how He sees the world, and we can do that because we have the Holy Spirit of God that helps transform us. So how does this happen then? How does this transformation happen? And I think this is something that for some of you, you need to sit up and start and listen to because oftentimes I get asked questions like, how do we do Christianity? How do you do the faith? It's not enough just to know about it. How do we, how does it actually change our lives? And I do think it's something that's lacking sometimes in the church. We get very philosophical, but how do we actually do stuff that brings about the transformation we're looking looking toward? So I'm going to share with you some things in my own walk. I'm not saying this is the only thing, but uh, this this is what's worked for me. First of all, the Holy Spirit has to be present in a person's life. And that sounds like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised how many people try to pursue spirituality, be it Christianity or just some kind of generic spirituality, or, you know, they dabble in Buddhism for a while, they'll dabble in Christianity for a while. And the reason why they're they're not really getting anything out of all these things is the Holy Spirit of God isn't in their life. If you want the Bible to make sense, you have to have the Holy Spirit of God in your life. If you want to understand how Jesus sees the world, you have to have the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And how do you get this? Well, the first thing, this is the most obvious. Jesus talks about it all the time. You repent of your sin. You you die to self. You turn away from your own self-directed life. And you rely upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that his sacrifice is enough to pay for the sin that has separated you from God. You accept that as your own. You repent. You turn to the Lord and you ask for the Holy Spirit to fill your life. And God will respond to that. He will do that. God isn't like saying, going, oh, I don't know. He wouldn't have died on the cross if he didn't want to respond. He did everything. He emptied himself. He walked among us. He suffered for us. And he didn't go through all that just so he could make things more difficult. It's just turning to him and asking him and accepting what he's done and asking him to take your life and to, to be the Lord of your life, and he will do it. And some people have a supernatural experience that, attend, that accompanies that. 
Some people don't. I'll talk more about that later. But that's the first thing. You've got to have the Holy Spirit in his mind. And then, secondly, Jesus says it's, not, it's enough for the servant to be like the teacher and the servant to be like the master. That's a, that's a simple but profound statement. What does it mean? Well, it means you need to surrender your mind to Christ and trust God with your mind. I think this is the sticking point for a lot of people. Surrender your mind to Christ. Trust God with your mind. I think a lot of people struggle with this because they have an overblown estimation of their own mind. They frankly think that their own ways and thoughts are just too precious for God to meddle with. And so they, have, they kind of have this overblown sense of self that says, you know, well, I don't want, I don't want to be controlled like a robot. I don't want to be brainwashed. So I'm not really going to give over my mind to the Lord. Let me tell you a couple of things. From experience, no matter how much you would want God to turn you into a robot so that you just do everything right and you have no real conscious thought of your own, God won't do it. He won't take that away. I used to pray that when I was a young Christian. I used to pray, Lord, just take it over. I'm tired of trying to fight with my mind. Just take it over and everything you want, just put it in there. I'm fine with it. I surrender all. Take it. And he never would just take it. Because that's the easy way out. And God isn't interested in creating a bunch of robots that just are erased like you'd erase a hard drive and then he impresses himself upon it. He wants a relationship. So don't worry. If, you, if you're afraid you're going to become some kind of spiritual robot controlled by God, I wish he would. But he won't. Because he wants you to know him. He wants you to grow in relationship with him. God's not, you know... I could program a computer. Well, I couldn't, but someone could. These people in the back could. They could program a computer that every time I press uh, the space bar on the keyboard, it says, I love you, Jeff. I love you, Jeff. I love you, Jeff. That would mean nothing to me, right? Would it mean anything to you? Really? If you just push the space bar and your computer tells you, you, love you it loves you? That doesn't mean anything. What's important is relationship. You know, a real person, a real human being, by their own, you know, as they deal with their own weirdness and, and craziness, they come to the place where they understand that they love you and you love them. That's relationship. That's what God wants. He doesn't want a bunch of robots going, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And so that's not, he won't take your mind. And you say, I don't want to be brainwashed. You know, well, you should be brainwashed. Our brains could use a little washing, but he won't do it. What he will do is he'll give you a perspective. And this is where also this is scary. Surrendering your mind means God will give you a perspective on yourself, which is very intimidating to some people. They don't want to really get too much into themselves because you're going to have to deal with that little bit of crazy that you carry. And you all, we all carry a little bit of crazy. We all carry a, 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 a misconceived sense of self sometimes, a misconceived sense of others how we react to them. And sometimes, for many people, I can tell you, when it gets into really going deep into having the mind of Christ, that confrontation of self is what holds them back. They're afraid. I'm afraid. We're all afraid. You have to go into these things and God says, okay, well, what about this? What about that? You know, you're, you're really thinking of yourself here in this way that is frankly not true. And your sense of God, your sense of self, your sense of the world is going to all be changed. That is intimidating to some. And you say, it's not intimidating to me. Well, then you probably really haven't gone through it. Because when you're confronted with your own little bit of crazy, and you realize that you have to deal with this, that this is part of who you are, it's a humbling thing. It's humbling. And you realize, okay, it's not, it's not like the little bit of crazy goes away either, just to give you a heads up. It's just that you're aware of it, you deal with it, you have to work through it, and you're more comfortable with other people's crazy as well. That's kind of, that kind of describes the church, by the way. It's a whole room full of a little bit of crazy that God's working through. And you're all part of it. Some of you are looking at me like I'm the only one that has a little bit of crazy. Trust me. 
So it's challenging, but if you want your faith to be more than just a set of teachings, that's just a religious set of teachings, which grows stale after a while. Keeping rules gets stale after a while. Relationship is always much more uh, meaningful. It's much more satisfying, but it's also much more challenging. One of the ways you can do this was actually mentioned today, again, by Johannes talking about these, you know, memorize these songs because they're scripture, is to memorize scripture. Memorizing scripture is encouraged in the Old Testament a lot. It's encouraged in the New Testament. And the reason behind memorizing scripture isn't just so that you can walk around with some encyclopedic knowledge of the scripture. I mean, that's great, but that's not the point. The point is when you begin to memorize scripture, then God will often take that and he will use it and you'll find yourself in, in real life situations being able to apply that scripture that you've just memorized. And people will, and I know this happens, I kind of call it the spiritual synchronicity, because people will come to me and they'll say, this is happening, is this normal? It's like, it should be normal, because it does happen. Yeah, and you've probably noticed, I've seen some noddings of the heads, you've experienced this like a passage that you've read and you really got into, like you really dug into this passage, or you memorized a scripture, or you read a devotional and you really read it carefully, then you suddenly find yourself encountering that very thing in the world around you. And secular folks will try and say, well, that's just because you're seeing what you've wanted to see. You've kind of put this thing in your mind and now it's manifesting itself. Like when you hear a new word for the first time, and then all of a sudden you start hearing it all the time. But I've experienced that thing. I've experienced that secular thing of learning a word for the first time, then seeing it. And there's a big difference between that and what I'm talking about in the spiritual synchronicity. And I know there's a difference because I've experienced it. And a lot of you have probably as well. For example, years ago, I learned a new word, the valance. And I hope I'm saying that right. But I don't even know because it's, it's not a word I use very often. But I had a lady come into my office and say, she looked around my office. And, I, and, and this is back when I was in the U.S. And I had these curtains by the window. She goes, I need to put a valance up. And I was like, what? I don't even know what that is. Apparently... It's that little strip of cloth that goes across the top of the curtains. You know, just kind of accents the top, right? I didn't even know that there was a word for that because interior decoration is not my thing. And uh, I didn't even know that there was a special word for the little doohickey that goes over the top of the curtains because that's how I would express it, the doohickey that goes over the curtains. But there's a name for that, the valance, I guess. And I began to hear this all the time then. And I don't know if it was because I was suddenly around people who were interior decorating, but I heard this word being used all the time. But there's been the times when God did something in an extraordinary way that, that is a whole different thing of transforming, transforming the mind. And I'm going to share with you a story. I've shared with you this before, and it's a little bit of the supernatural, and it's a little bit of the just the Word of God right in your hands, right in front of you. I think most of you know, I think most of you who, who know me at all, you know that I'm not the most experiential, emotionally driven guy in the world, right? It's pretty clear. I'm not, yeah, it's just not who I am. It doesn't mean that it's right, doesn't mean that it's wrong, it's just who I am. But when I was a believer, and I've told this story before, I was in Germany. I became a believer in Germany. I gave my life to Christ in 1986 in Germany, kind of between, on the way to Bremen. And we were at a YMCA. We were spending the night there and, and, uh, with these two buddies of mine. And I went out to the river and just did the leap of faith. And I've shared that many times. But what happened after that was kind of interesting because I, I'd really given everything over to God. And I know at that point, that was my point personally, that I can say I was in relationship with God. Maybe I was earlier. I don't know. Now I know. At that point, I know. And I didn't have a Bible. I didn't have any Christians around me. I had no Christian influence whatsoever. My friends just thought I was just taking like, <laughs> I had just gone a different direction as a result of drug abuse into a different little weirdness over here. And they figured in about two weeks I'd be back to normal. Because I went and I told them at the, at the YMCA, I said, I think I just became a Christian. And they were like, what? You went out for a walk and you come back and you tell us you're a Christian? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, whatever, dude. And for about two weeks, I had this thing happen that I've never had happen again. It's like I would see, just kind of in my mind's eye, even with my eyes open, I would see, this is going to sound weird, I would see Scripture. I would see a white page with black letters, and I could 
kind of in this daydreaming mode, kind of read what was on that. It, it, it was very strange. It only lasted for about two or three weeks. And when I went back to the U.S., I got a Bible, and I began to read it. And I was amazed to see that a lot of the stuff that I had just kind of seen was in the Word of God. But that seeing the Scripture thing faded away and never happened again. And for a long time, I used to mourn that loss. I used to mourn that breaking in of the supernatural in a situation where there was no other, had no Bible, there was no other Christians around me, so God just kind of carried me through these few weeks until I could get back to a place where there was a church that I was associated with through my parents. I could get to the Word of God. I could read it in my hands. And I was, I used to mourn that loss. I'd be like, what did I do wrong that I don't have this experience anymore? And I finally, and it took me a couple of years, finally came to the place of realizing that God was carrying me in a special way during that time. It was a unique time. I needed a unique carrying. But when I got home and this was available to me, God's expectation was through discipline and through passion, I expect you to know this. And I expect you to use it, to read it, to get it into you. You don't need to have you know, the baby food being fed to you. Literally, you know, spoon feeding the scripture into your mind. When you have this, I expect you to grow up and to use it and to grow disciplined in it, and have your mind transformed by it. And so that's what happened. And then you know the story, I tried to go to university, and I almost failed the university the first year, because all I wanted to do was read the Bible. I was consumed with reading the Bible. In fact, I almost flunked out, and the lady that, that was looking through our, our uh, grades and stuff, and she said, according to all the tests we've taken, you should be a good student. So what's the problem? What'd you get into? Girls, drinking, gambling? You know, what's, what's the problem that you're dropping out of school or you're failing school? And it's like, all I want to do is read the Bible. And she thought I was joking. She just laughed right in my face. You've got to be kidding me. It's like, no one's ever tried that excuse before. <laughs> then finally, when she realized that I was telling the truth, she said, religion's not good for you. But I graduated with two degrees, by the way. So religion was fine. So that's just an example of my own little kind of, you know, both supernatural, both mind being transformed, and also the difference between that experience and learning a new word. Vastly different. And I think most of you can also, if you've been there, you can experience, agree with that. Finally, follow the little inklings. These are the, those are those times you just get a sense that, that you need to do something. Have you ever had that happen? This, I, I need to call this person. Or I need to, to go, for whatever reason, to this place. Follow those little inklings. As long as they're not leading you into sin, you know. If you get this little inkling that says, you know, I need to go to the strip club, that's probably not from God. But if you get this little inkling, you know, I need to, maybe I should call this person. I don't know why. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no sin involved in it. Follow those little inklings. Because a lot of times that is God speaking to you. And the more that you follow those, the more you'll become familiar with how God speaks to you. Because God does tell you things. I do believe God speaks to his people. I do believe God speaks to me. I do also know that there are sometimes those little inklings are hard for, to follow. Sometimes they're easy to follow and you get these great, you know, these people tell stories. Oh, I, I just kind of felt the spirit lead me in this and I did this and it was great. But sometimes those inklings are hard to follow. You know, personally for me, the inkling that's hard to follow is to call people. You know, I have a phone phobia. And it's no joke. People think I'm kind of joking. It's, it's no joke. I don't mind answering the phone. Well, mm. But me having to take the initiative to actually call people terrifies me. I don't know why. It's just something I have to work through. It's just the way I am. God will get me through it. But I have found that these little inklings to call people, there have been times that I've had this inkling, I've had this inkling, I've had this inkling over and over, and I just, just can't bring myself to do it. And then I find like in about two weeks, this person was real, two weeks later, this person was really going through a rough time. And I should have followed that inkling. And that's, you know, that's, I sometimes am good with that, sometimes I fail with that. Follow those inklings. And maybe if God calls you, in a, and, you know, you get an inkling in a different sort of pool, because if calling people on the phone isn't a problem for you, you probably just do that out of pleasure anyway. Like this thing we do at the end of the service, call someone. Oh. <laughs> to, me, to me, it's like, oh, do I need to do this, this calling my wife count? <laughs> but 
you know, maybe it's an inkling for you about, you know, you know reading the Bible, or it's an inkling for you about, you know, something that you're, you're putting into your heart or putting into your mind, or it's just, you know, about forgiveness. Sometimes God puts on your heart that you have hurt someone and you have no idea you had. And so the inkling is, why don't you just go and just tell that person, I'm sorry if I offended you, and just see where it goes. Sometimes the person will say, well, there's no offense, there's no big deal. Sometimes the person will be, thank you. I needed that because I was also struggling in a place of sin because of this. So follow the little inklings, because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And the more you follow those, the more you'll recognize, ah, this is from God. I know the inkling that's coming from God to contact people. It still becomes my area of uh, obedience, and that's a place of growth in my own life. So, as you're a Christian, as you're, if you're new in your faith, and you're kind of wandering along, kind of wondering, how do I do this? How do we submit my mind? Well, these are some things you can do. Surrender, memorize scripture, follow them in the inklings. And if you've been a Christian for a while, and these things aren't happening in your life anymore, then I would encourage you to go back to it, because God doesn't change, but we do. And sometimes we can be believers for a while, and we can just kind of let our minds go, and we find ourselves back into the old places. The sin of who we are, we have sin that is just part of who we are. And driving our lives and our minds is like driving a car that's always out of alignment. You know, when your wheels are just a little bit turned. And you can drive a car that the wheels are a little bit turned, but you have to keep your hand on the wheel all the time. If you decide to let your hands off the wheel, because its natural inclination is turned, the car is going to go off the road. You can drive the car, but you have to be concentrating. You have to be correcting it the whole time. That's kind of like what it's like for us right now. You know, we have within us the Holy Spirit of God that allows us to correct those inclinations towards sin. But our natural inclination is still towards sin. We let our hands off the wheel and say, well, I've arrived, so therefore I don't need to hold on to the wheel. We're going to end up in the spiritual ditch. And there are all kinds of examples around you throughout your spiritual walk that you've either been in the ditch yourself or you've seen people go right off into the ditch. And what happened? They just put their hands off the wheel. Sometimes it's, I just give up. It's too hard. They go in the ditch. Sometimes they put their hands up and go, ah, I got this made. I can drive without my hands. And they go in the ditch. Or sometimes they just get distracted. What'd you say? Well, and they're in the ditch. It's, it's a constant, constant correcting. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can correct. Well, people without the Holy Spirit, they can't. You know, they just end up going in the ditch all the time. And they get caught up in these things, and they never really advance really emotionally or spiritually with their life. And what's the payoff of becoming like the master? Well, the payoff really is this thing that so many people are always asking, what is it God wants from my, what is it God wants from my life? What am I supposed to do with my life? And the payoff, if you give yourself over, you allow Christ to, to, to work through your mind, to transform your mind. You see things the way God sees things. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. It won't be good luck. It won't be circumstance like, well, I guess if the door is closed, the door is open. You'll know. This is what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I can tell you that is really what it means to have peace with the Lord. Peace with the Lord isn't just everything's going easy. Peace with the Lord is being on the right track with him, and you know it. And this is what we've seen throughout Christian history. When people have known they're on the right track with God, then they are willing to go through terrible persecution. They're willing to undergo amazing hardship, and they do so with such courage and grace. How is that possible? Because their minds have been transformed. They understand that where they are at is where God's good pleasing and perfect will is for them to be at and they have peace in contrast sometimes to us that have everything that have all kinds of material goods that are in places of comfort and we still wonder what is it God wants for me there's still the spiritual torment it's because regardless of all the stuff going around us it can be all plenty and all good but if we are not able to test and approve what God's will is as a Christian this is an unbearable place to be so do you want that true peace? Allow your mind to be transformed. Then you will know what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is for you.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you are active in our lives, that you're not just a philosophy. And we say this all the time, but maybe we need to be reminded and say it again and again, that you're not a philosophy. You're not uh, just a, an idea that's out there that seems like a good idea. But you are, you are there with us. You are a living being, and we are your creation, and you are our creator. And yet being created in your image allows us to have amazingly wide uh, experience of life. Everything from joy to grief, from understanding that we are finite, that this life, this physical flesh will die, to understanding spiritual things, that there is something more, that you are out there. And you're not just out there, but you're within us and you're around the world, you're everywhere. And that we can be in relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that in places where we have withheld ourselves from you, particularly this place of the transformation of our mind, because we all, I think, know that our mind is our emotions. Our mind is where our reason is. Our mind is where our love is and our hate is. Through the transformation of our minds, we can become more like Christ. And Lord, we pray that you give us the courage to submit, the desire and the passion to submit so that we can not come out of the other end as robots, but we can come out the other end as people that have a deeper perspective and understanding of ourselves, of our God, and of those around us. And that knowing and having that deeper perspective will allow us to act as Christ would act in the world. And in doing this, they will know that we are Christians by our love. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.